I'm going to go quickly, so pay attention because a lot of it's reviewed. And when I, you need to stop talking, pay attention now. Everybody up here. All right. We're going to be talking about chemical bonds, specifically what they are, why do they form, okay, and how do they form. So, first things first. A lot of people have trouble defining what a chemical bond is because there's, you know, lots of ways to say it, but we would describe it as some kind of force or forces that hold groups of atoms together to make it function as a unit. We want them to function as a unit and we want them holding them together. Now, the reason why they do this, so why are they going to bond? They form because when their individual atoms, most besides our noble gases, are going to be unstable. So they're seeking stability. Unstable um, elements are at a higher energy. When they form a bond, it establishes a lower energy state for those atoms. And I'll show you in a few minutes what the diagram looks like there. The whole idea is when it forms the group, here it's, they call it the aggregate, well, when it forms the group, the individual atoms by themselves are in a much higher energy state. When they form the bond, they reduce down to a lower energy state and they're more stable. Okay? So that would be the Y. will form the energy is lower than if, it's, if they were separate atoms. Okay? So that would be the why as to why it's going to work. And now we're going to just well, we're going to look at an example with hydrogen, okay, showing you how this might work, that graph on the right hand side of your notes. So the way that we have this going, the interaction of hydrogen, first of all, they have to get close enough. So up here it's showing you they're too far apart to have some kind of attraction. Now you have two opposing forces going on here, too, because the nuclei are positive, the electron clouds are negative. So the electron clouds approaching each other would have repelling forces, but the nucleus of the other one will be attracting the electrons from the other and pulling them in closer. But it basically establishes a uh, lower energy state and a certain bond length, okay? And that's an optimum distance that gets it to that lower energy. So if we're looking at the graph that you have on your notes here, showing you a couple different arrangements of the hydrogen here and their energies. So this is their potential energies. Here we have hydrogens that are too far apart, still at a high, too high of an energy state. We have some that are too close together. It looks like they've been squished, so they're definitely not at their optimum bond length because it being too close has put them in a higher energy state. And here they're a little bit closer together. Yes, their energy reduced a little bit, but not close enough to really bring it down to a more stable condition. And last but not least, here is showing you the optimum distance, 0 0.074 in terms of nanometers here. But that really put, when it's at that distance, that puts the H2 at a very lower energy. And now it's stable, okay? So this is the why as to how they form, that how they get their bonds to do what they do is to get to that lower energy. So ionic bonding, let's remember that. What's ionic bonding? <laughs> the metal and a non-metal, but what exactly is going on there? Transferring electrons, right? So if I have sodium and I have chlorine, Sodium transfers its, chlorine, uh, transfers its electron to chlorine. Sodium now is plus one. The chlorine now has eight, has a minus one. And what is attracting them together is this electrostatic force between the charges. So that Coulomb attraction, the positive negative attraction, okay, is uh, going to be what is causing the bond. Not the, you know, atoms themselves. It's actually the positive negative that's, and it's a very powerful force. It's a very strong force. Covalent bonding, you know, they do what? 
share electrons, okay? So, um, like for CH4, methane, if you're drawing a Lewis dot structure here, one of the electrons came from the hydrogen, one of the electrons came from the carbon, and they're sharing the pair, okay? But this one we would say is nonpolar. We'll get more into that later because they're equally sharing those electrons. So what would we consider the ones that are kind of intermediate? Intermediate in between, not full transfer, not, not completely equal sharing. So intermediate would be? Yes, so when we have unequal sharing, what's that called? Polar, covalent. Polar covalent bonds is that intermediate where we have some unequal sharing between atoms and it results in partial charges. Partial negative, partial positive. Okay? So if I have something like hydrogen chloride gas, and yes, they would be sharing here. This is in its gaseous form, so it's not an acid. If it was dissolved in water, we would call it hydrochloric acid. But in its gaseous phase, it's sharing this pair right here. Okay? But the chlorine is pulling a little bit harder on the electrons and kind of like a little bit of a bully here, wanting the electrons to be around the chlorine more often than spending more time around them than around the hydrogen here. So the electron density will show that they are more on that side of the molecule. So then this side of the molecule becomes partially negative. And they use a little like small delta, and my deltas don't look very good. But the little small delta, you'll see them, they're kind of a little squiggly. Remember, big delta looks like this, triangle, small delta. Each Greek letter has an uh, uppercase and a lowercase. So they use the little small deltas to show that they are partial charges. It's not a full charge. Not like when it was with the NaCl, Na plus, Cl minus, that's a full charge. They put the little symbols there to indicate that they are partial charges, so they're not completely as strong, obviously, as ionic would be, okay? So you do get this unequal, you know, distribution here. And does anybody remember why the electrons are going to spend more time around the chlorine than they would around the hydrogen? because the chlorine is more electronegative, yes. So the ones that are more electronegative are going to have more pull, and so that's where the electrons are going to spend more of their time. So how do you know which side to look at? You're looking for the what? How do you know which side is going to be partially negative and partially positive? side closer to the right on the table. Yes, so the one that's more... Um, electronegative is going to get the partial negative. The one that's less electronegative is going to get the partial positive. So keep that in mind. <laughs> partial positive, partial <laughs> negative. Okay? So let's look at if you were to stick a polar molecule between two plates, okay? and run an electric current through it. As you see, they're going to line up by their charges here. This is hydrogen fluoride. Once again, in the gaseous form, because then if it was in liquid, it would be hydrofluoric acid. So we know which side is partially negative, which one should be? Fluorine, because it's the highest, most electronegative element on the table. Okay. And hydrogen super small, too, doesn't have a whole lot of weight, so... As you can see, before the electric field, they're kind of just floating around. But after they apply it, the positive sides attract to the negative plate. The, I mean, yeah, and the negative sides will attract to the positive plate. So it kind of has them line up. They start lining up. So now I'd like you to draw what it would look like for water. And how would we want to draw our waters? Making house here, yes. So we have something like that, right? Okay. The bigger atom is the what? Oxygen. The smaller are the hydrogen. So which side is partially positive? Hydrogen. Hydrogens are partially positive. And oxygens partially negative. 
Okay? So keep that in mind. So draw two plates, line them up, show what they would look like there. Okay? You don't have to draw, draw like three waters, make, make them, you know, your diagram looks something like that. I'm sorry, what? Just with an electric field is fine. So in this case, the way I would draw mine, I put the hydrogens on this side, facing the negative plate, like so. And you know how they love to have you draw things, so expect some drawing type stuff on your free response. Okay. So yes, our oxygens over here are the negative side. This guy is the positive side of the molecule. So the positive attracts the negative plate. The negative side will attract the positive plate. And they line up and they start looking like that same pattern. Like so. So the negative, positive, negative, positive. Oxygen sides are partially negative. The hydrogen sides are partially positive. Okay? So that's how it would look if you applied it to water. Yes? Uh, it depends on if they wanted you to do like a particle representation. If they want a particle representation, they're wanting circles. Mm -hmm. I do remember there was one in your KSP where they had you draw like how the calcium and the whatever would uh, how waters would go surround the calcium plus two or whatever that you needed circles for. Okay. Okay. Polar molecules. Oh, so, yeah. We don't need to see that because we already. Yeah, we can continue on. Here we go. Concept check. What is meant by the term chemical bond? Forces. Forces. Yes. Forces that do what? So they form forces that hold atoms together so it can act as a functional unit. Why do atoms bond again? To become stable. And becoming stable means they have lower energy. Very good. And how do atoms bond with each other to form molecules? How? 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 Transfer or share. Sometimes they don't share equally, remember? They do share, but sometimes not equally. Okay? Transferring electrons, sharing electrons, two ways that you can get the bonding to go. Okay? Good, good, yes, no. All right, electronegativity. Kind of talked about this last time. We'll hit on it again. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. It generally increases across a period. I do the increases, increases, rather than down a group. Down a group is going to decrease, but if you go up a group and to the right, it will increase, increasing in the same direction. Okay? Uh, the ranges of the electronegativity values go from 4 to 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is actually also for FR. So they are the least electronegative elements on the table. Whereas uh, fluorine is a 4.0, that means the noble gases do not get considered here because they don't have electronegativity values since they don't want to attract anything. They're already stable. Okay? Now, you do need to be able to remember how to calculate the electronegativity difference, okay? And figuring out um, those differences will also let you know the type of bonds, okay? The type of bonds that you're going to get. So, let's take a look here. You have one on the back of your notes, and I'm sorry that the fluorine part is really dark, but you could put a 4.0 above the fluorine so that you remember that that one's the most electronegative one on the table, okay? Who is the next highest besides fluorine? Oxygen's the next highest, okay? So fluorine is the highest, that's first. 
Oxygen's the second highest, and who comes in third for a tie? Chlorine and nitrogen are both 3.0. So, giving you a good idea of your values here. Okay? And if you can remember those ones up in the upper corner there, it really does help with a lot of conceptual understanding as to their, the highly electronegative elements. So, if lithium and fluorine react, which one has more of an attraction for an electron? Fluorine does. Why? It's more electronegative. Yes, it's more electronegative. Higher electronegativity. You could also calculate if you have fluorine, which is 4.0, um, and lithium's uh, electronegativity. What's lithium's electronegativity again? 1.0, right? So the difference is a 3.0, calculating that difference there. As you can see, its electronegativity value is much higher. But if you also think about the way that fluorine is, fluorine has more protons, more effective nuclear charge, and it only is needing one more electron in order to be stable. So it makes it very, very highly attractive to other electrons. Okay. So, in a bond between fluorine and iodine, which has more attraction, fluorine does, we know fluorine does, it's 4.0, what's iodine's uh, electronegativity? 2.5, okay. Now, what would be the difference between these guys, because they both just want one electron, why is fluorine more attractive though? Yes, iodine has more core electrons, so it shields the power of the nucleus more, so less effective nuclear charge there. Whereas fluorine, in terms of its ratio from its protons to its electron repulsions, because it's so small, it's going to be there as more attractive force to just grabbing onto one electron. And the size does matter there. Those core electrons lessen the pull of the nucleus. So it's not, you know, it does still, it's, it's 2.5 isn't bad, but it, it's not as high as fluorine. Okay. All right. So now it's your turn to do some calculating here. I did put this one on your chart. I mean, on your notes, this chart, so that you know the difference ranges. Pure covalent means like total equal sharing, by the way. Polar covalent is a gradient range, though. Because you, if you have something that's 0.5 versus something that's like 1.6, 1.6 is a lot more polar than the 0.5, even though they're both in the polar range, okay? But the 1.6 definitely is going to have a lot more of a dipole formed, which we'll talk about. Remember, dipoles have positive and negative sides to them, okay? Uh, anything above 1.8 is considered in the ionic range, okay? Yes, vaguely remember this from last year, good. Um, so... As you get closer to the ionic character versus closer to the covalent character, but it is kind of a big gray area, okay? It's not 100% one way or the other. It ranges, okay? So now I'd like you to do some calculating right here on to the exercise or the concept check. Uh, what type of bond is formed when there's zero electronegativity? Pure covalent or nonpolar covalent, we say to we put this in the nonpolar category. Nonpolar covalent is considered pure covalent. When there is an intermediate difference, we're talking about what? Polar covalent, and then when it is um, a large difference, we're looking at ionic, okay? So, now on to the exercise. Go ahead, calculate, 
figure out most to least polar. Most to least polar. So, arrange them from most to least. Hopefully you did your little subtraction from your, so check off. Obviously you would see you're looking for the most polar is going to have the biggest electronegativity difference. So, you know, C to F, C is what, 2.5? So this looks 1.5 difference. N to F is only going to be a point, uh, 1.0. And O to F is going to be a 0.5. So you want to list them based off of their electronegativity differences from most polar to least polar. Okay? Checking. Are we good with this? Kind of a review from last year. So, uh... SIF would be the biggest difference, whereas NO would be the smallest difference. And then for the diatomic ones, as you see, this would be 3.0 minus 3.0, and yes, you would get a zero electronegativity difference. So those diatomic ones are completely pure covalent and nonpolar. Okay? Good? Yes? All right, moving on. So... Looking up here at your choices, which of the following bonds would be the least polar but yet still be polar? Which one can I cross off immediately? Because that's going to be zero, so we're going to get rid of that one. What else can I cross off? Should automatically recognize it as being not anywhere in the covalent range. MgOy. It is ionic. It's a metal and a non-metal. So, you can cross that one off. Then you can limit now how many you have to actually think about in terms of their differences. So, then you would calculate the C to O difference, and that's going to be 1.0, right? Because this is 2.5 and this is 3.5. And what silicons again? <laughs> I don't have that one memorized. Let's look at that one. 1.8 and 3.5, so this is 1.7 difference, and this one's a point, point 0.5, excuse me, not a point 0.3, a point 0.5, okay, because that's 3.5 minus 3.0. So out of those, who has the biggest difference? SIO. Oh, I'm sorry, that would be not this one, sorry, you're right. This is 1.7, so we want the least, least polar is going to be no, and O. But it's still polar, it still fits the range because it's above 0.4, but it is the least polar out of the other, other two involved. Okay? I think I was looking at the next question. You'll easily recognize it now. So, which of the five would be the most polar without being uh, considered ionic? So SIO, we already determined that was 1.7. That guy's zero. That guy's ionic. This one was 0.5. And this one was 1.0. So SIO is the most polar out of those three. Okay? Keep that in mind looking there. SIO. All right. Dipole moment. Dipole moments use arrows. And the arrows are going to depict which way the electrons are spending more of their time. So you're going to use an arrow, or you'll see an arrow on a diagram that looks something like this. The end of the arrow where it has the little kind of part that does look like a plus sign, that's going to be the positive side of the molecule. Okay? That's going to be the partial positive side of the molecule. Over here would be the partial negative side of the molecule, where the pointy end of the arrow is facing. That's where the higher electron density is going to be, and that's where most of the time the electrons are spending their time. And you're going to see them either in a ball and stick model. You'll see them on either electrode, uh, on a ball and stick model or electron density graph. And I'll show you what those look like in just a minute. So really for the dipole moment, you're representing where the unequal sharing is going, okay? The pointy end is the negative side. The other end of the arrow is going to be the positive side. 
thumbs up. Go ahead, take a moment. I would just, this is what I would write on my paper. So this is the negative side, this is the positive side, showing the arrow, okay? This is used in diagrams. Okay, and that's going to be depicting, this is the dipole moment, depicting the unequal sharing for the polar molecules, okay? So as you can see in this diagram I'm about to show you, okay, you're going to see the arrows in there. So, ball and stick model, this one's just showing you the deltas, okay? That gives you the partial charges. But over here in B, it's actually showing you the dipole moment. The arrow is pointing towards the oxygen. The other side, this part, is showing you the positive side of the molecule over by the hydrogen. Okay? So if I were to be drawing it in here where they show you the more like an electron density graph, the red side being more densely packed with electrons than the blue side, the arrow would look like this. Okay, so keep that in mind. When you're looking, they have those pictures in your textbook and they show them to you in there. And this is going to be important when you're looking at, obviously water is bent shaped and it is going to be polar, we know this because we've learned water for so many times now, we know it's polar. You can have dipole moments without actually being a polar molecule. So looking at carbon dioxide, remembering carbon dioxide has that linear shape. And if you draw the Lewis dot structure of carbon dioxide, it's the double bonded one. Okay, and it forms that linear shape. The, pole, the bonds between the C's and the O's are polar, however. So, remember, this is going to be a difference of 1.0, and this one's going to be a difference of 1.0. So you have polar bonds here. But the entire molecule itself is considered nonpolar. So the whole thing is nonpolar because of its shape, because it has symmetry. That symmetry is showing because of the dipole moments pulling against the central atom here, there is no dipole occurring. You don't have one side of the molecule positive, one side of the molecule negative. If you look here, they're both pulling equally, so you really have two sides that are both negative, okay? So there is no dipole created. In order to be a dipole, one side has to be partially positive, one side has to be partially negative. So here, if I'm drawing the dipole moments for carbon dioxide, one goes this way, one goes this way, okay? And then you don't have, you have a nonpolar molecule, even though it contains polar bonds. All right, isoelectronic series, I promised we'd come back to this. Here we are. Series of ions and atoms contain the same number of electrons. Now, over here, Oxide is the largest, whereas aluminum would be the smallest. And I want you to tell me why that is. Why would that happen that way? Why is oxide the largest out of those? What do we have going on there? Gaining electrons does what? Creates more what? No, it's bigger electron cloud. Bigger electron cloud, sure, but it also, the bigger electron cloud is due to the what? Electron repulsion. Yes, you have more electron repulsion. Yay. Yes, thank you back there. But also, what else should you be considering in terms of size? Not just the electron repulsions, also the oh, proton. proton number. Remember, effective nuclear charge is about both of them. Okay, there you go. So how many protons does oxygen have? Eight. So oxide's only going to have eight. How many protons would the aluminum have? So this one's going to have 13 protons. 
And this one's going to have only eight protons. The 13 proton one also lost three electrons. So guess what it gets to do to the 10 that's left over? It pulls them in much closer. Exactly right. Sucks them in. That's right. Okay, so I want you to do the bottom one. Put them in order from lar uh, smallest to largest. Ready, set, go. What's the order? What's the order up here? Who's the smallest? Who's the smallest? No? All right, then who comes next after standing up? Calcium. Then comes potassium. What's next? Argon. Argon. Chlorine. Sulfide. Or chloride, sulfide, and phosphide. There we go. Phosphide has the least amount of protons, but also gains three electrons. More repulsion, less protons, bigger atoms. <laughs> Excuse me, bigger ion. All right, on to next. We're going to be talking about formula prediction for ionic compounds, specifically ionic compounds. And this is going to be the new stuff that you don't know, so you definitely want to pay attention. And we're going to talk about, you know, covalent bond polarity and also intermolecular forces here in just a minute. Okay. Lattice energy. This, this is something that's completely new, so please take a moment to try to absorb it. Lattice energy is basically how strongly the ions attract to each other in the solid state for an ionic compound. So the higher the lattice energy, the stronger the bond, basically. Okay? So the higher the lattice energy, the stronger the bond. And you're going to have to be able to tell some things from the lattice energy about, you know, the strength of the um, ionic compound, its melting points, its boiling points, generally, to be able to trend that based off of the lattice energy. Okay? Now, there is an equation for it, although you don't have to memorize the equation. You just have to be able to understand the conceptual nature of the equation because we're not actually going to have you calculate with it. The lattice energy, you know, equals a proportionality constant, but the things to focus on really are this part of the equation, the Q's and the D. So that's going to tell you the relationship of the lattice energy. The Q's are the charges on the ions, so the actual numerical value of their charges. The D is the distance. Shortest distance between the centers. So the size of the atom matters and the charge of the atoms now matter. So let's think about this. I'm going to compare NaF with MgO. Okay? Now, we compare their sizes. Sodium and magnesium are very close in size because they're right next to each other. So their size is negligible. It's very close. O and F also, their sizes are very close to one another because they're right next to each other on the table. So the size, the D part, isn't the huge factor here. But what will be the huge factor? What kind of charge is sodium going to get? Plus one. Fluorine's going to be a Mg is going to be a plus two, and this one's going to be a minus two. So because they have more value in their charges, the magnesium oxide, this top number is going to be larger. So who's going to have the higher lattice energy? MgO will have the higher lattice energy. So if it has higher lattice energy, it's going to have a higher melting point. Okay? Higher boiling point. Not that these guys boil because it's hard to get them even to melt because their melting points are so high. But now let's look at an example where maybe the distance or the radius, the size of the atom is going to play more of a role. So if I was comparing these guys, okay, to say, um, looking here, let's still stick with our NAF, but let's say we're, we have, um, 
rhodidium bromide instead. Comparing these guys. So in this essence, have the same charges, right? But what's the huge factor that would determine the lattice energy here? Rubidium's in the fifth energy level. It's a much bigger atom. And bromine is also bigger. It's in the fourth energy level. So the D number down here at the bottom is going to be a lot larger, therefore decreasing the lattice energy. So you have to look at not only the charges, but also the sizes here to determine the lattice energy in relative amounts. So we would say who has the higher melting point here? It's going to be NAF because it's smaller and therefore the lattice energy should be higher. Okay, so yes, once again, the rubidium bromide's distance is bigger, so its denominator is going to be bigger, therefore its lattice energy will be smaller than the NAF, therefore NAF stronger, lattice energy means tighter bond, means higher melting point. All right, so we're going to take a look here at a quick little video. Hang on a second. Kind of comparing all of the, um, we're going to be comparing all of the different energy changes going on in the ionic solid, the formation of the ionic solid. So hold on a second. Hopefully it'll be nice and loud here. All right. This foreign Haber cycle helps us to understand the energy changes involved in the formation of solid sodium chloride from sodium and chlorine atoms. The first step is the transfer of an electron from a sodium atom to a chlorine atom, and it is energetically unfavorable, requiring 147 kilojoules of energy. However, 493 kilojoules are released when the ions are brought near each other to form an ion pair. An additional 293 kilojoules are released when the ion pairs form an expanded crystalline solid. Therefore, the sum of 786 kilojoules is released when sodium and chloride ions form solid sodium chloride. Finally, the overall process of sodium chloride formation from its elements is energetically favorable, releasing 639 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so... This born Haber cycle... What it's showing you here is that it's going to, there's a bunch of different energy changes going on. So we have some endo and we have some exothermic energy changes going on. So I want to show you, um, I put it on your notes for you. Sorry, hold on a second. There we go, back here. All right. Before we get to the, the um, listing of, of the uh, steps going on, Remembering that when we break bonds, it's always going to be what? Um, Endothermic, good, positive, and when we form? Exo, okay. Forming is warming, good. Now, I gave you the steps in your notes to kind of follow what's going on here so you can project the energy changes. Uh huh. Going to that lower energy state and releasing some of it, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. That's exactly right. All right, going from solid to gas, subliming the metal is going to be endo because you're breaking the um, bonds in order to boil it, get it to the gas, going, well, actually it's subliming, so it's going directly from the solid to the gaseous space. Now, you have to pull off an electron, that's ionization energy, that requires energy to do that, that's endothermic. Now, to get the other part going, you've got to break apart the bond of the non-metal. Usually these are going to be your diatomic ones, like fluorine or fluorine here. You have to break that bond, that's endothermic. So these are series steps here to get the formation of uh, ionic solid. The last two steps, though, are exothermic. Here you're having the nonmetal attract the electron. In this case, that Coulomb attraction is exothermic. And then last but not least, the full charges coming together to make the solid. This is where you get the huge jump 
and they are highly exothermic. Okay? Now I wanted to point out to you on here, okay, this one's comparing magnesium oxide with the sodium fluoride. Although their overall changes are very similar, because here's the overalls, this is like negative 602, and this one over here is like negative 570. Very similar in their um, overall changes. But the difference is, look at the lattice energy. This is the lattice energy, negative 3,916. Lattice energy on the MGO, much, much higher than the lattice energy over here, which is negative 923, and that's the NAF side. Lattice energies are hugely different. Okay? So, the point you got out, now the ionization required too for the MGO is much higher. This is the ionization energy portion of the deal. So as you can see, that is a huge jump too, but ionizing two electrons off is going to be a lot more energy than ionizing one. Okay? So these graphs are just showing all of different energy changes going on to get that overall and quite exothermic reaction of forming the ionic solid. Okay, so this graph, although not in there, basically just showing you the relationship between ionic character of a covalent bond uh, and the electronegativity differences, okay? So as you can see, most of our covalent belong down here, okay? There isn't a huge difference, so their percentage of ionic character would be considered lower. There's one that kind of floats in between right here, HF, because its electronegativity difference is 1.9, so technically that falls in the ionic range. However, we really don't consider HF an ionic compound. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But as you can see, all the other ones that are up here are all the ones that are definitely metal, non-metal, and have a transfer that's a uh, difference that's higher than 1.8. So technically, HF kind of falls in that ionic character range. We don't define it as being ionic because the operational definition of an ionic compound is that when you melt it into its molten, you know, liquid, it's not really liquid, it's kind of more like molten, and run an electric current through it, okay, and you're able to conduct an electric current through it, then it's considered ionic. Can't really melt down HF because it's in its, it's usually a gaseous form, so... Okay, we consider that one still covalent. A highly polar but covalent compound. Okay. So, operational definition of an ionic compound. Conducts an electric current, okay, when it's melting. That's what you need there. Alrighty, on to some wonderful intermolecular forces. I know you wanted to recall these fun things. Hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, London dispersion. Okay? Hydrogen bonding, strongest of the IMFs, but there's only a few cases of hydrogen bonding. H having bond, yeah, it's bond with H. There you go. Dipole-dipole can also be called just dipole interactions, or it can be called dipole moments, okay? But do remember that the bigger the electronegativity difference, the more polar you are, so the bigger dipole you have. And then London dispersion, sometimes are called just dispersion, sometimes they're called van der Waal forces, but everything out there has London dispersion forces, because all atoms, all molecules have electron clouds involved. And if you have an electron cloud, you can do London dispersion. So that even includes the noble gases that don't react with anything. They still do London dispersions. Okay? So keep that in mind. So, yes, moving back on to recalling our H bonding. Having fawn with H. So that means you have to have... HF, HO, or HN in the bond molecule. So, 
If I show you one like this, if I drew the Lewis uh, structure of a molecule here like so, does this guy have hydrogen bonding? No. It has lots of H's and an F in it, but it is not hydrogen bonding. Because the bond is not between the H and the F, it's between the C and the F, or the C and the H. So this one would just be considered a dip-dip, or a dipole-dipole, okay? It still is polar, because obviously this guy is creating an asymmetrical shape, so it's going to be polar, and yes, it's going to be a permanent dipole, but because none of them are actually between the H and the F, it is only considered a dipole-dipole interaction, okay? So keep that in mind. So you might see some that have H's and O's. You've got to really specifically look at where the bond is occurring. Okay? So let's draw hydrogen um, fluoride and how this works. So we have our partial negative with our partial positive over here. Now, the intermolecular force of hydrogen bonding actually is occurring as you can see, these blue dotted lines, these are actually the hydrogen bonds. And they are intermolecular, inter. That means they're between the molecules. The one that, the, the covalent bond that's actually in the molecule, that would be an intra-molecular force, because it's the actual covalent bond, intra versus inter. Inter is between, between molecules. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're looking at your drawing. And these are stronger forces, but they're, you can break them, but it does allow for something like hydrogen fluoride to be cohesive and attractive to itself, like water, okay? Another fun, fun facts. So our inter versus intra and be able to draw, look at, if you had to do particulates, you would use circles, you could use circles. Okay. Ball and stick models. Dipole dipole is a permanent dipole because it's polar. Polar or asymmetrical. The one thing that you do need to make sure that you note know, that you get more polar with bigger electronegativity differences. So like H to Cl versus, say, HCN. If you look and compare those two, they're both polar molecules because they're asymmetrical. But the electronegativity difference between HCl and H here, this one's going to be a higher electronegativity difference. This one will be more polar. And this dipole-dipole interactions are going to be a lot higher. Over here, your electronegativity difference is only like 0.5. So this one's only like slightly polar. So the dipole-dipole interactions aren't going to be as strong. Okay? So keep that in mind. You have to look and compare the electronegativity difference to see who's going to be stronger. Okay? After Leonard dispersion, I'll, I'll let you stop, okay? So we're almost done. A few more moments. Because there's really only one little thing about London dispersion and the temporary dipole. So remember the electron clouds, when they come near each other, they repel each other and they form temporary dipoles. They can be called induced dipoles. They can be called instantaneous dipoles. But the idea is that they're not permanent. They don't last forever. So the 
the important thing to know about London dispersion, everything has London dispersion, but the amount of the electrons matter. More electrons, higher mass means your dipole is going to be bigger, so that means you're going to have more strength. So something, things that are both nonpolar, the one that has more mass is going to have more electrons, therefore it's going to have a stronger London dispersion force. Okay? So that's what's important to know that if you have more electrons, you're bigger, your London dispersion force will be stronger. And I've seen some of those examples as well, even on your practice tests, where they give you like four nonpolar things and you have to figure out which one has the higher melting point or boiling point because the London dispersion forces would be stronger in the ones that have more mass, more electrons. Okay? So the temporary dipole, as you see, because they're getting close to each other, you have the repelling. So this cloud repels the other cloud, so you have partial positive and a partial negative side, and it's temporary because the second that it moves away, the cloud, the dipole is now gone. So these ones are temporary, they don't last forever, they're not permanent like the dipole dipole polar molecules are. So here, anything nonpolar, and if you're looking at symmetry, that would be symmetrical. So, not permanent. Okay, that's important to note, not permanent. And number of electrons. More electrons, higher the London dispersion force.